A Frightful Adventure in Mississippi by Alexander McNutt, writing under the pen name Turkey Runner. This article first appeared in The Spirit of the Times, April 3, 1847. During the last summer, I accepted an oft-repeated invitation of an old friend and accompanied him to his plantation, Chicoria, where we spent a week very pleasantly, notwithstanding the heat, in hunting and fishing. This place is situated on the celebrated Deer Creek and extremely isolated, being the first above its confluence with the Yazoo River and by the sinuous course of the creek, 60 miles below the next plantation. The surrounding forests are celebrated for game. Bear and panther, and especially the latter, are or have been more numerous here than in the vicinity of any other place known in this singular and wild region of country. I had long promised myself the pleasure of following a good team of dogs through these unexplored wilds, and of slaying at least one bear and panther before I left. You can therefore imagine the pleasure I experienced when after repeated disappointments, I found myself at the close of a day's hard ride entering the quarter yard at Chicoria, and in doing so, rousing from their evening slumbers a famous pack that had assisted in hurrying the spirit of many a gallant old he to kingdom come. I have had it in anticipation frequently since to write an account of the week's sport, but I have deferred it so often and long that I am apprehensive that I have forgotten some of the most exciting scenes. One incident, however, was so ludicrous that I will give it, and if it is deficient in soul-stirring interest, it may serve as a warning to some of my readers. Our success had been neither good nor indifferent. We had hunted four days and had killed a bear, several deer, turkey, and wildfowl. The evening of the fourth day found hunters and dogs worn out with constant labor and debilitated by the extreme heat of the weather. And that evening, while sipping our coffee, discussing and laughing over the mishaps of the day, it was concluded to spend the morrow with the rod and a celebrated lake about three miles distant. To this arrangement I yielded a reluctant consent, not only because I was very much fatigued, but fishing is a description of sport that never had any charms for me. I found it impossible, however, to decline the polite solicitations of those who had labored so hard at my line and the next morning at daylight all hands, properly equipped, were in motion for the lake, where our sport, if such it must be called, was of the most successful and exciting character. At least so I found it, and the balance of the company were too well bred to complain of their luck because mine for once had been more marked than theirs. It is impossible to describe this singular sheet of water. I have visited many of the large lakes lying between the Sunflower and Deer Creek, but none of them will compare with this in wild and dreary scenery. It is from one to three miles wide and formed by the overflow. Its banks are flat and muddy and covered with decaying trees, limbs, and the water fringed by coarse grass and weeds. Huge trees grow upon its banks, invariably leaning over the lake, and from their branches grow in profusion the Spanish long moss, drooping to the surface of the water. Many of these trees, after attaining a certain size, owing to the weight of the moss or the light and saturated soil in which they grow, fall into the lake, and as they decay, grass and weeds grow upon them. Their mass of roots, woven together and cleansed of soil by the rains, afford a secure retreat for reptiles and insects, myriads of which breed here. The bark of the trees, the moss, vines, old logs and decaying leaves are all blackened by the overflow as far up as the water rises, some thirty or forty feet. Back from and parallel with the banks of the lake, there are ridges or drifts of sand. Between these grow dense thickets of willow, all of the same somber color, and the lower limbs decaying, whilst the surface of the earth is covered by falling branches that crack and rattle under your feet. The whole scene is dreary, desolate, and offensive. The very atmosphere, loaded with unpleasant odors, falls with a chilling influence on the spirits. 
There are found no gay plumaged birds warbling among the trees, always a bright feature in southern forests. No noisy kingfisher dashing over the water. The only representatives of the feathered tribe were an eagle dreaming on a dead branch projecting from the surface of the water, and the foul birds that feed upon the noisome shore. After carefully depositing our rifles in the boat, we embarked, and we were rowed out and down the lake to a famous stand, a raft formed of a mass of logs that had drifted against the roots of a sunken tree. Here I was deposited, whilst the balance of the company continued on about three-quarters of a mile below, to another and similar place. The water out here was a different color and looked less offensive than near the shore. Very unexpectedly, I soon found myself deeply interested. The trout and white perch bit beautifully and kept me industriously employed in pulling them out. I had been absorbed by the excitement over an hour, by which time the sun had become oppressively warm and satisfied with my success I wound up my line and looked for my companions. They, however, had left the first raft and proceeded further down the lake where I could see them intent upon their sport, and, from appearances, profitably employed. Whilst watching my companions and making signals for their return, I saw an immense alligator locomoting across the water, slightly in the direction of my location. I had neglected to take my rifle out of the boat, and I regretted it very much, as he would probably approach near enough to give me a shot, and I had not killed an alligator. Whilst watching his motions, I was nearly thrown into the lake by the plunge of a monster alligator gar, who was near enough to dash the water over the log on which I was standing. These gar attain an immense size in the lakes, from seven to ten feet long, and strong and bold as a shark. This little incident made me nervous and the more anxious to get to the shore. I therefore continued my signals, and whilst so employed, I was sensible of the approach of something in the water, communicated, I presume, by the swell, and turning around, beheld within ten feet of me a very large alligator. The log on which I was standing was a large cottonwood and attached to the raft by its roots. I was some thirty feet from it, and the alligator midway between me and that. I could not therefore reach it without passing close to the alligator, an experiment which I was not inclined to attempt. It would be a very difficult matter for me to describe my feelings at this moment. I will not deny that I was very much alarmed and commenced retreating towards the top of the tree, from which there was a large, strong prong projecting some ten feet above the water but it was a difficult matter to reach it, as a point of the log between me and the prong was submerged, owing, I presume, to a bend in the tree, and here from the rotting bark was growing a clump of tall reeds. I moved along, however, cautiously and lightly as possible, passed over a portion of the sunken point, and had reached the reeds and considered myself safe when I discovered a large water moccasin coiled up and almost under my feet. He lay there basking his loathsome scales in the noontide sultriness, his round, diamond-like eyes fixed upon me in a very unequivocal manner, and his long, fiery, and purple-pointed tongue hissing defiance. I was too near to use my fishing rod and stepped back to club it and strike. As I did so, the snake uncoiled and moved towards me. This accelerated my retreat, but in an instant I was ready for him, and throwing myself back, was stung on the calf of my leg by something that made me involuntarily spring forward, and in attempting to leap over the snake in front of me, my foot slipped and I fell, and snake and all went into the lake together. Thereby is the first thing I said, or rather thought, this is what you get by fishing in such a hole as this. You are now in the same bed with an alligator, an alligator gar, and at least two snakes. This, or something near akin to it, crossed my mind as I was going down, not unmingled with the sense of my dangerous and ludicrous situation. I had very little time for reflection, but I knew it would not do to come up in the same place, because if I missed being gobbled up by the alligator, I would find a snake ready to twine around my neck as soon as my head appeared above the water, 
or sink its fangs in my hand if I attempted to keep it off, so I attempted to reach the shore. I swam as far and as long as I could without coming to the surface, and when I did, you may rest assured I did not throw away much time. Under I went again, and soon had in some degree recovered my self-possession, when my foot was struck by a large body that made me shrink, and for a moment give up all hope, expecting to be torn to pieces every moment by the alligator. But in an instant I summoned more resolution, and straining every nerve, pushed on and soon reached the shore, half strangled with the thick water and covered with mud and slime. I presume I must have struck a log with my foot instead of being struck by the alligator, as I never saw it afterwards. I sat down on the bank, trying to collect my scattered senses, and in a few moments was joined by my companions, who had discovered something wrong. The boat was dispatched from my hat, seen floating near the raft, and for my handkerchief tied around a small limb of the tree where I had been standing, and with which, no doubt, I came in contact when I thought myself stung on the calf of the leg. My tale was soon given to my companions in its most frightful form. Instead of commiserating with my misfortunes, they scarcely retained their gravity long enough for me to finish. This, I then thought, not only rude, but unfeeling, and I returned to our quarters that night in a very unpleasant mood in consequence. Soon after I arrived, while I was introduced with marked ceremony to the stranger, and in my familiar intercourse with him, soon forgot the vicissitudes of the day, and so ended my first and last day with the ride on Dismal Lake. The end.